All right. Welcome to the Marketing AI Show. I'm joined today by Matthew Sweezy, Director of Market Strategy at Salesforce, author of The Context Marketing Revolution, and host of the Electronic Propaganda Society podcast, which is insane, by the way. I, I love what you did with that. So welcome, Matthew. Great to have you. Man. Thanks. I love being here. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. So Matthew and I were just like, we got chatting before this started and we we're like 10 minutes and we're like, oh my God, we should probably just start recording. We're just like going because we could talk about this stuff all day. And what triggered this is one, Matthew was actually going to be a keynote for our, our marketing AI conference in 2020, which we obviously had to cancel. And he was going to be talking about the post AI consumer in that. But then he shared something on LinkedIn recently that was like, AI is going to be essential in your role. And here's the four reasons why. And so I like kind of went over and checked out this AI is calling post that he had. And I was like, this is just a perfect topic to talk about. So that, that's what this podcast me about. But Matthew, I want to I want to take us back a little bit, because one of the things you and I touched on before we you know hit record on this is this idea that consumers use AI dozens of times every day in their life, but they don't they don't mm -hmm. seek that technology and that you and I share this belief that moving forward, AI is just going to be seamlessly integrate everything you do. But you were the number 13 employee at Pardot back in 2009, a marketing automation tool that got acquired by Exact Target for 95 million. And then Exact Target got bought by Salesforce. You've been in the marketing automation world since the early days. You wrote the book on marketing automation for dummies in 2013. Take yeah. me back to 2009. Are we even talking about AI back in 2009? Are we thinking about no. it as an industry? No, not at all. What was marketing uh, automation in 2009? Revolutionary. Yeah. Um, 2009. So let's go back to 2009. First off, set the landscape, right? If you look at where we are, the marketing landscape, just go to Scott Brinker's map, MarTech landscape. There, in 2009, there were 150 marketing tools. Um, we were one of three, or I think at the time, there might have been five marketing automation vendors. Only three of those survived. Marketo, um, HubSpot, Pardot. HubSpot wasn't marketing automation were, until 2005. 15, okay. 14, 15. They used to say marketing automation killed kittens because um, they didn't believe in it. <laughs> so it, it was a revolutionary concept. And when we were talking with marketers about this, and let's go to the core basic function of marketing automation, Boolean logic. If then do this. If email's not opened, wait three days, send this next email. If person looks at this web page, score them with this score so we know who to talk to about what. Super basic functionality. That basic concept was revolutionary in 2009. Go to modern time where we are now. It's, there's, first off, the landscape is 50 times larger, right? There's now 8,000 plus tools uh, inside of the marketing technology landscape. Marketing has become the largest IT budget of every organization, um, eclipsing the actual IT budget for the IT department. And so you have this radically different world, not to mention the world has changed as this has happened. Right. So like, you know, we'll get into this in a little bit, but we have to really understand that marketing was so basic in 2009. We, we were just doing email blasts. People were still buying lists. I had to tell people, please don't buy lists. I mean, we literally had to have policies put in place that you couldn't buy lists. And you had to check a box that you were importing opted in contacts that you did not buy these. Like we didn't have to put that in until like 2013. Um, but that's still what people were doing in 2013. So the concept of like where we were was super basic. Digital was super nascent. Social was, you know, I'm going to post. I'm super basic. Everything was super basic compared to where we are now. So let's just go with 2009. We were a baby. Yep. So Exact Target gets acquired by Salesforce for two and a half billion in June 2013. You're you're mm -hmm. still there for that acquisition, right? You're you're part yep. of. Yeah. You know, I was... And that's around the time you wrote marketing automation. For dummies. Exactly. Exactly the time I wrote marketing automation for dummies. So, so I wrote marketing performance blueprint around that time, 2014. And I remember going through these exact scenarios in the book. You got Marketo, you got HubSpot IPOs in 2014. You got the exact target acquisition for two and a half billion. So we are literally talking about billions of dollars in valuation, billions of dollars mm -hmm. in acquisitions and mergers, and not a drop of artificial intelligence within the products that are... None. Yeah, being valuable. So one of the things I always say within this, for our audience is you haven't missed this yet. AI is moving really, really fast, but we are talking about seven years ago as an industry, the biggest companies in the industry still weren't 
even thinking about it. They didn't have machine learning engineers dedicated to marketing and sales. They, they were thinking about human powered rules-based automation. And you know why, you know why we were, let me, this is an important fact. One of my friends had a startup and this was an AI based startup back then. What it was going to do was automatically create websites, dynamically create websites on the fly for infinite personalization. You know, they failed. The reason they failed was because marketers wanted complete control over everything the customer saw. They did not trust a uh, software to create the best experience. I think why. that's changed. A hundred percent, at least for the smart marketers. All right. So then you, okay. So you're an evangelist for Salesforce after that acquisition, uh, 2012 to 2015. Are you talking about AI as an evangelist? I, I you and I met on the speaking tour. I mean, that's kind of how we got to know each other. I, yeah, that's definitely how we met. I don't think I was talking about AI in 15. I think it probably took to, I probably have only been talking about AI at a serious level for probably three years. Okay. Yeah. Cause then you move into the principal marketing insights from 15 to 20. And then you just yeah. in January 20 moved into this director of market strategy. Now, keep in mind for everybody listening, like Salesforce has been one of the leaders. I mean, they've spent, it has to be north of 10 billion buying up AI tools. Like they've bought all these things, kind of mashed them into Einstein. Mm -hmm. So again, Matthew is at what would be considered by many to be a leader in the AI space within the marketing sales industry. And even there, it's only been in the last three to five years where AI has really surfaced to the top of, of minds and where you've started to see within your research and even in your writing and speaking to where it's now kind of landed to where we're in this like post AI consumer where you're already talking about post AI. So why don't we kind of transition into where are we today? Like what, when you look at the landscape now, how do you think about AI? Well, there's different landscapes. Let's set the stage first off. There's a business landscape. So when we ever have a conversation of AI, we always frame it from me, the business employee, how does AI affect my business? Yeah. That's usually how the conversations always flip. It's never looked at from the consumer standpoint, which is why you know, I wrote about the post-AI consumer. And I, actually, I coined the term post-AI consumer mm -hmm. in my book. With the post-AI consumer, we must realize that here's what happens. As soon, 2009, theoretically, I wrote about this, proved it out mathematically, 2009, consumers became the largest creators of content in the world, surpassing businesses. And number two, the largest creator of, of content are their personal devices. Just think about the notifications that you receive. Think about a Fitbit and how it motivates you to, to take 500 more steps. In. That's all personal content. When we look at that, now we start to realize that organic reach on social is less than 1%. The reason that is, is because there's so much content that you are now competing, right? Mark Schaefer wrote about the content glut, right? We have this massive amount of content. Well, that is a problem for a human. So how does a platform create the best experience? Well, it leverages AI to create a contextual experience, not a chronological experience. And so now AI is sorting anything that a consumer touches that is digital. It's completely controlled by artificial intelligence, period. So what a post AI consumer is, is a consumer never asked for AI, but every consumer that touches anything digital before they actually get to the end result is being filtered through artificial intelligence because that is the modern world to create the best possible experience, right? So that is the post AI consumer. They never asked for it, but everything they touch in digital world is artificially intelligent, artificially controlled by AI. Then you look at the other side. So that side is, is very advanced, right? You know, Netflix, Amazon, Facebook, anything. Spotify. Spotify. Yeah, pick, pick your poison. Um, from the business standpoint, that's a different landscape. That is a how does my business operate, function, produce, create. Now, if you were one of those companies we listed, you are a very advanced AI practice because you know how AI produces the best outcome for business because that is what you are selling. You are selling an experience you have understood how to optimize that experience and leverage AI to do so. You've also learned to leverage AI to create better revenue potential, right? Amazon, 13% of Amazon's revenue is from their ad server. What do you think runs that ad server, right? Behind the scenes, that is a lot of fancy uh, technology that is saying what ad goes in what place, how do we optimize price? How do we do all these different things, right? We're starting to see AI in all these different formats. Netflix, you're gonna see different images for the different shows based on what AI thinks is going to be contextual to you to get you to watch that film or show or TV show, whatever it is. So the landscape is very different. Every consumer touches it. Not every business has it. Um, businesses have it in different applications. We were talking about this earlier. So if we survey and ask everybody, which we do, I think the number is 84% of marketers use artificial intelligence. 
But we must be very clear when we use that number because that is a, it's not a, a, a AI is like a sliding scale, right? Every marketer uses AI because every tool that you have has AI baked into it. If it doesn't, it's going to. Right now, the, the marketplace is as follows. Every, there's, there's tools. There's tools that can be up-leveled with an additional purchase of adding artificial intelligence to it. Yeah. And then there's tools that are brand new that come out with AI empowered in them, which you're not even asking to buy it. It's just they know that the best way to get you the best outcome is to give you AI automatically. Hence, you're going to stay with my tool because it creates the best outcomes for you. You didn't ask for AI. You asked for better outcomes, and that's what they delivered. Right. So that's where we're going. But right now, most people are in this process of I've got a standardized technology set. I've invested in all these tools. I've got to maximize those values before I ask for any additional money before I can then start to add an AI. That's even if they really realize they need it. So I'm going to stop with that because I'll just I can go on and on and no, on. I mean, it's, different landscapes. Yeah. And it opens up so many paths to go down. I, I, the, the one that I think is interesting um, so one of the ways we talked about this at the, the, the marketing Institute is it's just smarter technology. Like at the end of the day, you buy marketing technology to solve a business problem or achieve a goal. It's the only reason you would buy it or only reasons. So if you're thinking, oh, I, okay, I'm, I'm missing the boat. I got to go get some AI. I, I keep hearing it's, it's really important. No, like if you do email, you just need an email solution that helps you be a better marketer, helps you do your job more efficiently, helps you create convenience and personalization for the consumer without invading their privacy. And as Matthew's saying, like the only way to do that is with AI. So you can go to your existing solutions and say, are there smarter ways to do what we're doing? Is there an upgrade option where I can get some machine learning that helps me predict things? Like I keep hearing it's supposed to be helpful. Or you can go find tools that are being custom built to do very specific tasks within marketing. But that kind of spectrum you talked about of, you know, there, there are these companies that are building specific tools. Even then though, just because they have it doesn't mean it actually works or they've proven their AI is any good. And I feel well, like that's a challenge. A that. Yeah, that's a challenge we're having is as a consumer, like how do I buy AI tech as a marketer? Well, there's a trick because a lot of companies are going to say they have AI, but really it's just ML, right? We don't even as a market, as consumers of, of this technology, even under, if you ask a marketer to define the difference between ML and AI, I guarantee you that most of them can't define the difference. And that's a problem because a lot of the companies that are marketing AI, really it's just ML, right? So it's not true AI, right? So we have to be also as an industry, really be clear on what is it actually doing and understand the difference between ML and AI. Um, so when you actually are buying something, you know what you're going to be getting. Yeah. And so the way we talk about it, and I, I'd be interested to hear your take and if Salesforce even has a point of view um, and whether it's the same or, or slightly different than how you look at it. But what we what we look at is generally speaking, AI is sort of the umbrella term for these tools and technologies that make machines smart. Like Demis Asabis from DeepMind has my favorite definition of AI, which is the science of making machines smart. They don't know how to do anything on their own. The primary subset of AI is machine learning. And that is making predictions about future outcomes based on historical data. And then it keeps learning and evolving. So what we see though is ML is the abstract, the more abstract thing. People think it's, uh, it's all data science, which it is, it's just math. Um, but they think only data scientists and engineers can understand machine learning. So they, they kind of shy away. But if you think about the branding of the industry, it's Google AI, it's Microsoft AI, like they're running ads, branding AI. They're not yeah, talking about machine time. learning, like, because they're just trying to get people to understand that smarter technology exists and you're going to have to give up your data to get it. Like, that's my perception of where we're at as an industry is the big guys are all just trying to make us as consumers comfortable with this AI, whatever it is, because when I go into Fitness Plus from Apple, it's going to say, hey, we're going to watch everything you click on, every instructor, every course in this thing, because we're eventually going to personalize your experience. It's, is it okay to have your data? That, they're only asking that because their machine learning is going to learn what I'm doing to predict what I will likely do in the future. But like, that's the, it is a challenge. This, and I talk to lots of these vendors, and they're struggling to differentiate themselves with the, the B2B buyer because they do have better technology, but the buyer doesn't understand machine learning. So like they can't talk about the machine learning to those people. And so they go back well, to what you said, they talk about outcomes. 
Well, yeah, from a standard marketing practice, you, you, you sell the sizzle, not the steak, right? You shouldn't right. sell features. You should sell benefits and outcomes. Um, and the outcomes are we can produce better outcomes. It doesn't matter what you're using behind the scenes, right? Because then you're going to start to slice them. Well, well, here's my algorithm. And here's why that algorithm, no, nobody needs to know that, right? Like <laughs> no one's going to care. You don't want to know what goes in the spaghetti sauce. Right. You just want to know it's good spaghetti. Like that's all that matters. Um, and so we have to get to that place of outcomes. And, and AI does have limit, like ML does have limitations, right? So right. it's like, let's go back to the use case of in the B2B space for years. There's been, and, and I'm curious to hear your take on this, but mm -hmm. for the past few years, and I don't know if we do it as much now, but there was definitely a lot of technology that said, listen, tell me all of your customers and I'll find, I'll tell you who the new customers are that you should go focus on, right? right. So using AI and, and ML to go find new. The problem with that is, is it was very hard for uh, the technology to say, okay, how to go into new markets. It couldn't identify new markets. It could only identify existing customers inside of the marketplace you're already selling in because it couldn't make the connections outside. You know, so we have to understand there's limitations that will be solved by a true AI, right? Yeah. Whereas ML can't go outside of that. Yeah, if, if, you, if true AI means that like intelligence, like true general intelligence where it finds problems to solve, because where we're at today and however you term it, at the end of the day, what it's enabling us to do is make predictions about outcomes. And as you're saying, it only can make predictions based on existing inputs, the data it's mm -hmm. taken in in the past. So it's not going to, it, it solves the problems you tell it to solve. And then as a human, you have to figure out if that's a good solution or not, but it, you have to give it the problems to solve. So like it can be semi-creative in its approach to things, but you have to give it the guardrails of what, what to solve for. So yes, it's not going to find the anomalies. Like if, if and this became a huge thing with COVID. So if you were making all these predictions about lead scores or about consumer behavior, if you're an email marketer, like, do I use emojis? Don't I, do I use free in the messaging? Like all of these things that machines could in theory make predictions on by learning from thousands of emails you've sent or hundreds of thousands, those almost became irrelevant in April of 2020 because the consumer changed. The consumer wasn't exactly. going out anymore. They, they, you know, the things that, and the machine learning models couldn't have foreseen out ahead. They had to now learn from an entirely new data set of how this consumer behavior was evolving. And that, that is a deficiency in machine learning, but well, it doesn't it's, mean it's not it's valuable. It's, just, in, exactly, yeah, it's also deficiency in how marketers think about data. Yeah. Um, marketers are going to have to rethink their data strategy, right? Their data discipline, freshness has to be a key critical component of your data strategy for this exact reason, yeah. because you have to realize that if you, and, and so let's pivot this conversation really quickly to talk yeah. about data. The post cookie future, we have to understand that first party data is the key to everything that we're going to be doing in the future, right? That is the number one thing. So you're Explain what you mean by that real quick, just so people understand like how the world exists right now on cookies, that the automation is enabled by cookies but when we can't yeah. use them and why we aren't Good. able to use them maybe for a second. Yeah. Quick cooking class and cookies. Cookies come <laughs> cooking in three class. flavors. Yeah. First, second, and third. First party is data that you collect from somebody, such as someone comes to your website. It's your owned property. You're allowed to collect data. That's first party. There's the term zero party, which is a subset of first, which is essentially anything that someone explicitly gives you, such as I clicked this box. I filled in my name. I give you explicit permission. And I filled out a list, right? given data. And then there's second, which is shared first party data. So I'm Amex, you're Delta, we go into a partnership, we share data, that's second party. Third party is me tracking somebody else on some other person's site. That is what's going away. So third party cookies are going away due to privacy concerns, right? This is the marketplace regulating itself before the government does draconian measures, exactly what's happening. You then move forward and say, okay, how does that then change everything? It changes everything. Ad tech marketplace yep. goes away, right? You're going to have everything now inside of walled gardens. Uh, the, the concept of multi-touch multi attribution goes away because you can't do it if you can't look at where people are going on places you don't own, right? So the, the, it's going to radically change so many different things. What then do you do in that new world? Well, you have to rely on first party data. And so what you're going to do is we had this big shift of content marketing. Well, that's going to get accelerated and content marketing is going to get reformed in the first party data collection. That's exactly what we expect to be happening, which means that you're not just going to have content you produce. 
you're going to be um, hosting free Wi-Fi. You're going to be creating data ad, uh, dating apps. You're going to be doing a thousand different things that are out there designed to collect very specific data from very specific people that is continuous, which brings in fresh data. This is goes to the freshness piece yeah. because you need to have a continuous stream of new data to then run these pro and run, run on this AI. So that's what I mean by the freshness and that data discipline and why first party data is so critical because it has to be fresh for this data for the AI to know in real time, what am I looking at? And then this then brings up lots of other questions such as, you know, how much data do you need? Um, how, how good is data? You know, do we, do we decay this data over time? Like, do we have a score that then decays? There's going to be a lot. Data science is going to be a big fun thing. Anyway, that's just pin in that. No, that's awesome. And a really practical example for people is like, I, I was doing a webinar recently with RJ Talier at Pattern 89, and they have a, they've built an AI tool to predict the success of ad creative on like Facebook and Instagram before you run it. So they learn from all the performance data from, you know, millions of ads, and then you upload creative variations and it'll predict which one is going to work before you spend a dollar to run it. But their data shows that uh, the average creative um, runs its course within 10.4 days. So like if you're an advertiser today, you're going to go back like, hey, what worked four months ago when we ran the last Facebook campaign? Did we have people in the image or was it just like characters or was it computers or what was it? Was it just text? Let's just do that again. Well, that ad alone was old and over by the time you finished three months ago, more or less recycling it to be the ad you run now. And so just this idea of recency and this idea of like prediction, it's, I don't know, so much. I, what you just, what you just did. So there's a whole new concept that me and Brian Salas are working on. It's called okay. fast advertising. Get ready to see a lot more of this moving forward. The data that you just shared explicitly states why we have to think about fast advertising. If creative is dead in 10.4 days, the average consumer sees more content they've ever seen in their entire life. The question is, how do we stay relevant at scale for brands that specifically rely on mass advertising methodologies to have a relationship with their consumers? I hate to say it, but as much as we have people in massive brands, I'm just going to pick on toilet paper. Yeah. Toilet paper brands want to have a personal relationship with their consumers for obvious reasons. They're a brand. They want to have a personal relationship. I don't want to have a personal relationship with my toilet paper brand. They need to do one thing. They do that one thing well. That's all I care about, right? <laughs> and so the, the, the question we have to think about then is moving forward is then how do they then stay relevant? How do they build these relationships? Well, advertising is the method that they're going to use. It's push button. It scales. It gets them that relationship. The problem is to exactly what you just said is the traditional method of advertising runs on what I would call a traditional fashion model which is we have four seasons. We're going to have four major campaigns we're going to run a year. But look what happened to fashion. It went yeah. to every week as a new fashion trend, fast fashion. Advertising is going to have to keep up. And exactly what Pattern 89 is doing is what we have to rely on. AI is going to be that empowering method, which says, all right, marketer, here's what's happening. Here's, here's your sub audiences. Here's what's actually what they care about in real time. By the way, that's going to be curated by AI. Then the next step is going to say, okay, here are the things that we think you should talk about. Here's the messaging that we think you should you, you come up with. That's going to be powered by AI. You're then going to refine that, add to it. Then there's going to go into two different types of testing. You're going to have a pre-testing of let's test that message in real time. That's going to be inside of a lab format. It's not going to be public. There's going to be post, which is going to say, okay, now we've got the messaging. What is the actual advertisement? That's going to get put out into a lab. We're then going to be able to test how people react to that, whether it be with emotions, whether it be facial recognition, whether it be by clicks, whatever. That's going to be driven by AI. Then there's going to be the programmatic execution of that advertisement. That's going to be done by AI. Then there's going to come the feedback loop, which is, hey, listen, we saw all the ads you produced last month, and we realized that anytime that you have someone smile, you have a click-through rate increase by 10%. That's going to be done by AI. Right? So when we start talking about all these layers of AI, I made the prediction two years ago that by 2025, all marketers are going to become AI reliant. Right? And that means that you will have a very hard time competing without artificial intelligence because artificial intelligence is going to drive efficiencies so efficiently. I love it. So what does the human still do? In that scenario, you just listed like 10 elements of just advertising where the AI is going to do it. What's the human yeah. still do in 2025? Oh, all of the stuff that humans do well. Uh, AI can't go into a meeting and say, this is why we need to have this ad. AI can't go create the strategy of what we're going to do, where we're going to go, how we're going to do it. AI can't. There's so many things that AI can't do, right? But the, the things that we've relied on humans to do for so long, AI is going to replace and be more efficient. Now, 
the creative element. AI is going to be able to tell you what works. I don't really believe that AI is going to replace the creatives. Right. Um, the creatives, going back to the initial problem that we just said earlier of, if we say AI, tell me new businesses I should go after, it can only do that inside of the data that you've given it initially. It can't right. expand and create new theories and new ideas. It doesn't That's know you had a conversation do. yesterday about a total, entirely new vertical that could open up enormous possibility. It's not going to know that information unless yeah. you say, hey, go analyze this vertical for me. Tell me like what you learn about that. It's not going to know to look there, though, unless you tell it to look there. Yeah, so it's going to be a tool that's going to be leveraged. Um, it's going to be an enterprise scale. Um, everyone's going to be leveraging these things because they do all kinds of things. So specifically within marketing, expect by 2025, you're going to be reliant on AI, at least in one of those five categories, at least in one. I love in your AI is calling deck and we'll include the link in the show notes, but you talked about how Mars used facial coding version of AI to yep. determine their best ads for M&Ms. Can you explain that for a second? Because I think it brings a very tangible example to that list you just gave of all the things AI can do of a brand that's actually using some really advanced stuff. Yeah. So, um, so this is a case study. So Mars essentially said, all right, we want to be able to know, they're using advertisements to create and elicit a specific reaction inside the human. They want to create a very specific relationship and they're using AI to see in their ads, what emotion does that elicit in the person watching that advertisement? And there's very specific things they want to elicit. So they use AI and facial recognition. So they play their advertisements in front of somebody while using a camera that tracks their facial expression, that then notices how their face changes, which is then the representation of emotion. They're able to then say, we know this ad is the most effective at delivering the emotion that we want in our target demographic. Then that's the ad that they then show. Um, they have their own proprietary ranking system of like what they're looking for, but that's where they're using AI. Now, caveat, that technology is effective, but it's also questionable. There are questions. You'll see both sides. You'll see a vendor saying that this works. You'll see Mars using it. You'll also see vendors who are competing against that, who will say that may not be the best, there may be other methods. So all we're saying here is there's lots of different ways that this is going to be used. We don't know what the best method going forward is, but we do know that AI is going to be able to identify things that we can't identify as humans, and it's going to make us make, help us make better decisions regardless moving forward. Yeah, I, I, you and I could just talk for hours. I'm, I'm going to go back to your LinkedIn post, which is, again, what led to this. I'm gonna, I want to just talk about these four items, and I want to talk about your book for a minute, and then we'll, we'll kind of wrap up. Uh, so your LinkedIn post, and I'll just kind of read the first part. It says, AI is a major part of the future of marketing, full stop. This is obvious, but there are some ways AI will change things you may not have considered. And then you listed four. So I'm just going to give you each of these four, and you just kind of give me a you know, little narrative. Deep fakes may be a positive thing. What, what is a deep fake? And I've only heard about them negatively. So what, what is your point of view there? Yeah, so deep fakes, as we know them, is any time that um, AI takes or a person has AI take a person and an image and has them do something that they didn't do. So it, it manipulates the image. It, it could be Barack Obama riding a horse. Um, and he's never been on a horse, right? So like, it could be anything that you want. Or it could be your um, CEO saying something that he or she never said that could a, yeah, create it, a crisis plan. Yeah. Yeah, it's essentially it's anything. Yeah. The problem that we all see is the bad parts of this, but there are good parts for us as a marketer. And those are some very basic things. International translation is the easiest example to consider, okay. right? So David Beckham, um, they, there's a great example, David Beckham, where he shoots an ad talking about why you need to wear a mask. It's instantly translated into 17 different languages. <laughs> David Beckham's face, then the mouth changes to match the language in each one of those. So it That's looks awesome. like he's speaking each of those languages. So instant language translation, <laughs> in perfect language translation. So anyone that runs global brands knows the issues of global translation. It's very difficult. AI can solve that very easily. There's another concept in the same thing, which is, well, what if we were able to deep fake the person watching the ad and put them in the ad? That's a crazy thought, right? So rather like that is ultimate personalization wow. of like, Rather than like, you know, you watching two people sit in tubs for the Viagra commercial, it's you and your wife sitting in tubs <laughs> on the hill in the Viagra commercial, right? So it's like, he, he gets credit, Viagra, if you use that idea. <laughs> yeah, um, revenue. Um, so, but yeah, so that, that's the, those are some easy examples of deep fakes. All right. Shopping on the edge is the next major wave of commerce. What is shopping on the edge? The edge is defined as any place that is not a traditional brand or retail site. Instagram shopping, Pinterest shopping, these are great examples of okay. the edge. 
Um, essentially, what you're looking at is the edge is going to open up all kinds of crazy things. Full funnel experiences is really what AI is going to open up. On the edge, an ad can be targeted to anybody. Then that ad can be completely immersive by AR and VR. You can then go in and you can try on the products. You can demonstrate the products. Um, you have the IKEA Place app where you can actually put the furniture in your room, see what it looks like. You can then go through a chat bot, and, which is an AI-driven chat bot, mm-hmm. have a conversation in real time. You can check inventory, purchase, and everything. That happens all within the same moment on the edge, completely compressing the buyer's journey to a single moment that was targeted to an individual. That is no what human the, the AI is going to do on the edge. No human interaction. And by the way, those things are highly effective and efficient. I just did uh, the AR with a TV. My, my son um, got overzealous and, and threw something into our nice 55 inch screen TV the other night. And so I went on the Best Buy site and I'm shopping and it's like, oh, cool. I can visualize the TV in my room. And I did that. I pop it up. Air. Oh yeah, it looks good. Okay, fine. Buy it. Uh, all right. Number three, how do you, how you do your job? Yeah. So we just covered this one in the past, like 10 minutes of conversation. Mm-hmm. AI can change every element of your job moving forward of, you know, what you're going to do. Um, here's a really easy example. You're going to have your own personal bot that's going to direct your daily work. You're going to walk into the office and your bot's going to say, hey, listen, uh, last night I was looking at the website and I found that there's a new segment that you haven't identified. I looked at our current ad spend. and I believe if we shift this percentage of ad spend to this new demographic, we'll be able to see this return. Do you want me to do that? Click yes. That's what's going to happen and how it's going to dictate our tasks and moving forward. All right, last one. AI opens up full funnel experiences. So we, I just I, I hit that one because I forgot what I wrote before I wrote about, but let's play with one other one, mm-hmm. which is let's talk about AI as native product placement and a new idea for native oh, I love that. I've seen you talk about that one. I love it. All right, yeah, so here's it. the concept. Native advertising is essentially the concept that we are putting something in line that looks native to the format. Right, so that inside of Facebook, that means it's a post inside of an R, inside of a media property. It looks like it's a native article. Um, you know, so there's lots of concepts. But now let's go to let's go to television and mass advertising. Right, when we have OTT, which means over the top television, where we know there's a logged in user, we can identify who they are. AI now allows for native product placement inside of television shows in real time. So rather than everyone watching American Idol and seeing a Dunkin' Donuts cup or a Coca Cola. I can say this demographic sees 7-Up, this demographic sees Fresca, this demographic sees Kombucha, right? So it just depends on what you want to do. And that's going to open up this radical new world where everyone will see a different TV show where all the products inside of that show, even in the background, are going to be programmatically ad-based and AI inserted. So it's almost like when you're watching like a MLB playoff game and they've got the green screen behind the batters and... I never even thought about the fact that different markets might be seeing different ads, but you're saying that could be like a cup could basically be built into the production to function like a green screen in essence. And you could surface whatever ad you want or whatever product you want in that. Wow. All right, man. So what, uh, what do marketers do to get started? I mean, we just talked about some crazy, crazy stuff for five years from now. Like if you, if you're a marketer and this is, you're just listening for the first time and you're just starting to kind of get into AI and you are going to be intentional about trying to find some solutions. What's, you, what's your recommendation for where they start? Uh, step one, take a deep breath. Um, <laughs> it, it, we, we've just covered a lot of stuff that could freak you out and it could really say, holy crap, I am so far behind. I'm never going to get there. The stuff we just talked about is radical. It, it's super advanced. Like these are not going to become mainstream for years to come. Right. But we know they're coming. We already see examples of them. Right. So don't get freaked out. Two is have a very clear, specific goal that you're trying to accomplish and then work to accomplish that goal. Right. So it doesn't you don't need to go like you don't need to go hog wild. Focus on a specific task that you're trying to accomplish and then find the best way to accomplish that task. You know, and then when you're going through the evaluation, maybe educate yourself on what is actually behind the scenes. Is this ML? What kind of ML? What data sets am I going to have to have? And then walk into these things, but start testing now, right? You don't have to do it across your whole stack, but you do need to start investing and understanding where it plays and how it plays. And most tools, you can just simply call your vendor and just flip AI on. Um, You know, all of our products are enabled by Einstein, Einstein AI. So that's either depending on the product can be built in or it's going to be an add-on, just depends. But you can pretty much flip AI on anything right now. All right, so before we get into the the, the last element of the rapid fire. T- tell us about the content marketing rev- uh, context marketing revolution, which came out earlier in 2020. Um, tell us a little bit about yeah. that book. 
It's the yeah, premise. So the best marketing advice that I learned from this book was don't publish a book in a global pandemic. <laughs> right? like that's the number one key thing, right? Um, so what the context marketing revolution really means is it, it's, a, it's a theoretical book with practical advice. The theory is the very definition that we know of marketing no longer exists. And it no longer exists because the media environment that we operate in no longer exists. So I proved that we entered what is called the infinite media era, and specifically it happens in 2009. We already talked about what that means uh, anecdotally because now consumers are the largest creators of content, the second largest creators of content are their devices. What we must realize is marketing is a game and the rules of the environment dictate the games that we play. So old games that we thought of, such as sex sells, right message, right person, right time, um, the apex of direct marketing is one-to-one, -one, right? Those were games that we played based on the environment that we operated in. In a new environment, we must think about new games that we play. So really what the whole context marketing revolution is about is saying we must redefine what marketing means inside of our organization. There's a big conversation about digital transformation that's happening. If you don't transform the very definition and idea of marketing, I'm not saying get new marketing tactics and techniques. I'm saying scrap the idea that you have of what marketing is, reimagine it to fit the new world and the new reality. And that is then what will succeed in the future moving forward. Awesome. All right, Matthew, are you ready for the rapid fire? I have one in here that we haven't asked anyone else because I know you're an adventurer. So we're going to, we're going to end okay, with a, right. a fun one personalized to you. All right. First, first question, voice assistant you use most Alexa, Google assistant, Siri, Cortana, don't use them. Uh, Siri, I'm yeah. an Apple guy. I don't, see, I'm a Surrey guy, but if I actually need an answer to a question, I have to go to Google. Like just, mm. Surrey often won't get it. So I have, I have Google Assistant app on my phone too. And if it's like, we're on the way to school one day, my daughter is like, how far is it to the moon? And you ask Surrey and the answer was like, it was like, not that useful. You ask Google and it was like, envision this. And it's like, you stack it up. It's like, oh, my, da my daughter's like, oh, that was a much better answer. Ask Google next time. Um, Okay, more valuable in 10 years, liberal arts degree or computer science degree? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, I think that really just depends on what you're doing. Um, yeah. But in terms of like, if you, I think they're both inherently invaluable. I think they do, they're two sides of the same coin. One is how do I think about these things? The other is how do I practically do these things? Yeah. Um, so I think they're both inherently valuable. But I think those are probably more valuable than just general business degrees moving yeah. forward. All right, net effect over the next decade, more jobs eliminated by AI, more jobs created by AI, or it's not going to have a meaningful impact on jobs. That's, that's always the million dollar question of Isn't automation, it? AI, what does that do? It's more jobs. Well, yeah. I mean, we've seen this from studying everything from the 50s when we thought that basic uh, automation would, would take jobs away. It just creates more jobs in different aspects and different arenas. The hard part is that, you know, it, here's a really good example I was hearing the other day. We're worried about fat finger jobs, right? Fat finger jobs. If you've never had a family member who was a manual laborer, you may not understand what fat finger means. But anytime you're working with your hands constantly, those muscles get really big and you have these mm -hmm. big, burly hands. So that's the top concept of fat finger jobs. When we start thinking about all these things, there's a whole infrastructure that has to be created that is physical, right? There's got to be wire. There's going to be fiber. There's got to be boxes. There's got to be all these other elements inside of this world that are those jobs that it does take to support those things. Then there's the intellectual work of how all these things happen. I think a better, better question to ask is where do those jobs take place? Because now if we think about there is no physical barrier to these things, the question may be is where are those jobs located? Right. Not what jobs do we eliminate? And it is hard. It's hard for people that AI is abstract to, to a lot of people. It's really hard to see around the corner and envision it. I understand that people are afraid of it. I understand they worry, but For sure. there, there are enormous potential opportunities that it's just hard to, to see them coming. Um, all right, last two. What does an AI agent win first or at least share with a human? A Nobel Peace Prize, an Oscar, a Pulitzer, or none of them? Oscar. Yeah. I'm a Nobel Peace Prize guy. I think scientific uh, advancements. I, I, I mean, I, that's a, you can make an argument and I could agree. I know, I <laughs> see too. Uh, it's almost like, which is the more progressive thinking body that awards them that would yeah. like take the, all right, last one. Only time I'm ever going to ask this. This is only for you. Favorite adventure. So in your LinkedIn bio, it says outside of the office, I'm an avid uh, surfer, climber, snowboarder, mountain biker. 
you want to get me talking, ask about my last adventure. I'm asking you about your favorite adventure, either in the last Fav- year or all time. Oh, yeah. Favorite adventure all time. Um, so one of my best friends, his brother-in-law teaches in, was Uganda, now it's in Kenya. Okay. Um, and they have their, he is, he safaris on the weekend. So he's his own private four wheel. So we take a trip 10 days and we, uh, we four wheel across Uganda and oh, privately and just have a ball, um, you know, hey, camping with hippos, um, playing around <laughs> on the Nile. Um, like it was, it was crazy. So that was probably all time favorite adventure. That's awesome. Just when you wake up in the morning and your buddy's like, did you know there was a hippo literally outside our tent last night? <laughs> and I was like, no, the sleeping pills knocked me completely out. He goes, yeah, I don't have the sleeping pills. By the way, they make you snore. Because you were snoring, I saw the hippo. And I was like, oh, cool. Yeah. What year was that? Uh, that was just, I think, three years ago. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Well, next time we're together, I want to I hear more. <laughs> That's, I'm not an adventurer. Like, I, I, I just... We travel, my wife and I traveled a lot, but I am not a huge risk taker when it comes to being in other countries. So I live vicariously through people like you. No worries. The, the funniest part was before we went to bed, we went to bed with the sound of drums. No joke. There was, I don't know if it was like some tourist drum circle or if it was like some, some native population drum circle, but you heard them all night. And then like, that's how we went to bed and then wake up with the story of the hippo. It was a crazy, <laughs> crazy world. That's awesome. Man. Well, any final thoughts for our audience, just as they're trying to kind of wrap their heads around where we are in the next 12 months. And we talked a lot about the next five years, but just what they can do in the next 12 months to sort of get ahead of their peers, maybe. Just investigate, just start asking questions and constantly learn. I mean, you're obviously listening to a podcast about AI, so you're already interested in learning. Um, just to progress your practice, right? Maybe there's certifications you can get. Maybe you can start to have conversations of creating some type of a working group inside of your organization that's focused on AI implementation. How can we solve new problems in new ways? Um, there's lots of things that we can do, but I think that people that are listening to this, it's continue, keep continuing down that path that you're going down. Keep yeah. asking questions, keep investigating, and keep pushing forward. Yeah, it is the I, future. I love it. I just That's what I tell people. Take the, take the next step. Just read the next book, take the course, go to the conference. Like, don't try and do it all at once. Just commit yourself to the fact that the, the industry is changing and you need to start taking those steps forward. Um, best place for people to get in contact with you, find you online. You're a LinkedIn, um, LinkedIn guy or, or you Twitter. A Twitter? I mean, Twitter. I mean, I locked down LinkedIn, um, yeah. but Twitter is easy. But just reach out. If you yeah. want to reach out and chat, if you read my book and have a question, I'm very happy to chat. All right, Matthew. This has been awesome. I will do it again. I, I love it. I love talking about this stuff with you. All right. Thanks, everybody. This has been the Marketing AI Show. Until next time, we'll talk with you again. Thanks so much.